power is um, uh, defined as one minus beta, where beta is defined as the probability of a false negative. Um, now I'll, let's contrast that for a moment by talking about what a false positive is. A false positive is defined as alpha, and that's also known as the p-value. Okay, so, so so let me kind of restate this. So, so um, a, a p-value is basically trying to answer the question, what's the probability of rejecting the null hypothesis when it is in fact true? So if the p-value is zero, it means it's impossible. And if it's one, it means you are absolutely going to do it. So obviously we want p-values that are as small as possible. Uh, it can never be zero but you want them to be as close to zero as possible. And basically we say 5% is our minimum threshold uh, or really our maximum threshold. That's the ceiling that we'll put on this idea. So um, you go back to what we talked about at the outset. So the default position is uh, that, the, that the null hypothesis is correct, that there is no difference between the groups. So um, this term statistical significance basically means that the null hypothesis is rejected if the p-value is less than that pre-stated level. Um, I don't know if I'm explaining this really, really well, Bob. Is there anything you would add to this? Because I, I think this is an important idea, even though its p-values are so ubiquitous. But I, I, I think it's maybe worth spending one more minute on it before we go back to power. Yeah. I, I mean, to me, it, it sounds like it makes sense. I'm trying to think of, a, of somebody who might not understand it as well. But I, th I think, I think that the, those examples that you gave are good that, that, it, and this is, so you see on most papers, I think you'll, you'll see this P value of 0.05 and we can get into the confidence intervals, but you'll see 95% confidence interval, um, and P value of 0.05. And like you said, that that's your false positive rate. So I, I guess maybe imagine, and it's an arbitrary threshold. So you, you could try to submit a paper and I, I've seen, Sometimes it's, I usually catch it by the confidence interval. I'll see 90% conf confidence interval on some table and I'll there some figure or table and I'll look at it and it'll, they'll use a P value of, of less than 0.1 for, and maybe they have some justification for it or, or, or not, but it really is this arbitrary threshold. So I, I think like, imagine if your P value was, uh, you're going to, if it's less than, you know, 0.95, we're going to, we're going to reject the null hypothesis. So you, you could have a, you know, in, in theory, if, if this thing, if not, if 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 the you know it's, it's not exact, but if it's the chance of this being a false positive is about ninety percent based on your based on your analysis, um, that still you you would you would reject the null hypothesis that there's no difference between these groups, which sounds sort of insane. So it's it's kind of this I don't know I think it was this guy Fisher who maybe est established this 0 0.05, but this has been the threshold that they're they're more or less they're willing to accept at least for the purposes of, of a single trial. That the p-value of 0.05, that they're they're willing to accept a level of of a of false positive in their results and still um, make that claim that they they rejected that hypothesis. Right, because if you make the p-value so low, if you say no, my threshold is 0 0.00000001, well, then you really run the risk of discarding a lot of information that turns out to be kind of relevant. So. Um, you, you know, it is a fine balance between those two. So, so now that would the, be that would be a, a false negative, right? So, if it, exactly the, the lower there, yeah. So, you yep. there might be an effect, but you're not going to see it. So, so this false negative rate, um, we typically allow to be a larger number. It's typically between ten and twenty percent. And what that means is. The, 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 the flip side of that is we have 80 to 90% power because one minus that fa accepted false negative rate is called your power. And I, you know, I, I think this is one of the most important concepts to understand in designing any sort of clinical trial, whether it's humans, animals, any sort of intervention. So um, there's, a, there's a table, uh, they're all over the place, but this is the one I've always liked. It's old. It's probably 10 years old, um, probably longer than that actually, but it's out of uh, an old great uh, textbook, uh, cancer textbook on clinical trials. So, so pull up, pull up this table, Bob, and we'll kind of walk through. Okay. Got it. Power table. Okay. All right. These look a little intimidating at the outset. So let's kind of walk through um, how to interpret this. So 
what this table is saying is you want to presuppose you know what the difference is between the treatment groups. You, you, you have to say, I believe that the difference between the success rate in the treatment between group A and group B is going to be X percent. And the smaller of the two is Y percent. So let's come up with a real number. So I think that we are going to look at how this drug, um, you know, impacts your rate of surviving a urinary tract infection or being, you know, cured of this infection. And I think that the placebo group is going to have a success rate of 25%. And I think that the treatment group is going to have a success of 35%. So I think there's a 10% gap, and I think the lower of those two is 25%. So you go to 0.25 on the horizontal axis, um, and you go to 0.1 over on the, the, the column, and you'll see there's two numbers there, 459 and 358. And the upper of those two is if you want 90% power, i.e. 10% false negative, and the lower of those two is for 80% power or 20% false negative rate. And those numbers basically tell you how many people you need in each of the two treatment groups if you want to be significant at a level of 0.05%. So what do you notice when you look at this? You notice that the bigger the gap, the bigger the effect size between the two groups, the fewer subjects you need. So if you march from right, or pardon me, from left to right in this table, holding that effect size at 0.25, if you say, well, the difference is 15%, it goes to you only need 216 or 165. If the difference is 30%, so one group is going to have a 25% success rate, one group's going to have a 55% success rate, you're down to 60 and 47. And if you go out to a 50% difference, so one group is going to have a 25% response rate, the other group's a 75% response rate, you're now down to, to needing somewhere between 18 and 23 people per arm. And by the way, if you go down to 5%, one group responds at 25%, the other at, at 30%, you're at 1,700 or nearly 1,300, depending on your level of power. So I appreciate everybody kind of bearing with me as I went through this power table. It seems like one of the driest things in the world, but, but as my mentor once told me, it's the single most important table you should ever familiarize yourself with if you want to be in the business of designing clinical trials or basically any sort of experiment, because it is just so easy to get this wrong and over or underpower an experiment. So what does that mean? So to underpower experiment, I think is the more common mistake here. So you simply don't have enough people in the study to um, appreciate a difference if it is there. And so the study ends up being null. The p-value does not exceed the threshold of 0.05 and you say, look, there is no difference between treatment A and treatment B. When in reality, there may well have been, but you didn't have the power to determine it. And therefore, you don't actually know if you should have rejected the null hypothesis or accepted it. Does that, I think that makes sense, right, Bob? Does that? Yeah. That, yeah. I think the other problem equally sinister, perhaps not as common, is when a study is overpowered. And now you have more people in the study than you should have had for the effect size. And you start to find things that are statistically significant, but are probably irrelevant clinically. So you, that's when you start to pick up an effect size of 1% when you're dealing with something clinically that should never be thought of as being relevant below 10% detection threshold. So notwithstanding the fact that you also probably, you know, had more people in a study than you needed to, it could have cost more. And you typically don't see this as much with clinical trials, but you'll see this more with kind of data dump trials. Um, so, so sort of data mining studies where they're, you know, grossly overpowered. 
Um, Okay, I kind of got a way off on a tangent there. I don't know why I went down that path of power, but um, I know it's important. So I think we got on the subject uh, because we were looking at things you look for in an experimental study that increase or decrease your confidence in it. And I think it's something that's, if, if people have this list, it's, it's often left off. I think it's important. Yep. Okay, good. So yeah, power, power matters. And, and when you look at a study and it's not significant, you should ask the question, was this study powered correctly? And I mean, I can't tell just by looking, I actually have to pull out that table we just went over and, and go through the matrix and go, okay, well, you know, this yeah. is how many people were in it. Therefore at 80% power, they were detected to tell a difference between the two groups of this much with an effect size here. And, and, and then a lot of times I go, oh, wow, this actually study, this, this study wasn't powered appropriately anyway. So I, I've learned nothing new here, unfortunately. Is it true that you have a laminate of this in your wallet, this power table? <laughs> I don't anymore, but I used to have a uh, laminated copy at my desk, yes. Uh, I, yeah, I, I, made, I made placemats out of it for the kids. They, they love oh, very it. Very nice. Yeah. Oh, hours of enjoyment. 